Good morning. Welcome to the Daily Race. Today, we're talking about, well, the next generation. The next generation in this account of God unfolding his redemptive plan. He made a promise to Abraham uh, that through him there would be a great nation. And he had one child, Isaac. And Isaac, we read yesterday about him finding a wife, getting married. Now it's time for that next generation. And we're going to be introduced to another prominent figure here in uh, the book of Genesis, one that is going to uh, be very, very important throughout the rest of throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Um, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Here in Genesis 25, it starts off with the death of Abraham. So Abraham passes away at the ripe old age of 175. He's buried in that same cave that he brought uh, for his wife, Sarah, and he's laid to rest there. Then goes on to talk about Isaac. Isaac having finally at uh, kind of middle age, about 40 years old, he and Rebecca become pregnant um, and they give birth to some twins, Jacob and Esau. Actually, the order is different there because Esau came first, but just barely. Esau was the first uh, child that was born. Jacob came, it says, holding his brother's heels. So just kind of, there's this tension, there's this battle going on between them. And uh, Rebecca even mentions that. She, she prays to God during her pregnancy and God says that they're gonna represent two nations. <clears throat> And there's going to be contempt among them. So let's, uh, let's <clears throat> I'm sorry, fast forward here a little bit. Let's fast forward uh, to verse 27. Um, and this is a, an important interaction that sets up, well, what's going to happen for the rest of the book of Genesis that we're going to be reading here. It says this, As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Nothing like favorites. Nothing like parents having favorites that really sets up some healthy family dynamics, right? <laughs> Not a good thing here. So they've been fighting since birth. Um, since before they were born in their mother's womb, they've been fighting. They fought on the way out being born, and now their parents have chosen sides as well. So there's not a lot of, of unity happening in this family. Let's continue reading. It says, one day when Jacob was cooking some stew, <clears throat> Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. So, so what does this mean, firstborn son? So like we, uh, the, the, the inheritance, the, the family line, all of the, the, the things, the, the property, the resources, uh, the blessing, all of these things, in particular, in this family line, oh, it hasn't really been an issue up to this point because it went from Abraham to Isaac. Uh, Isaac was the only son of, of Abraham and Sarah. But now, that lineage, uh, that family line passes on to the oldest son. Even though Esau was only born seconds, minutes before Jacob, he gets everything. He gets all the blessing. He gets all of the property. He gets the whole, they call it the birthright. It's a big deal. And let's see what he does. <laughs> so this is kind of a silly, silly proposal. Esau's starving. Jacob's like, hey, I'll give you something to eat. Just give me your birthright. <laughs> give, give, me, give me your inheritance. Esau says, look, I'm dying of starvation. Esau said, what good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob says, first, you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his right as the firstborn. So what's important here to realize is that last line. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. Esau didn't appreciate the, the gift of being the firstborn. He didn't. He didn't fully recognize all that that meant. He didn't value it. He didn't see it as something special. He was willing to trade it away at a, at a moment's notice. I mean, think about this for a second. He gets back to camp. He gets back to their aid. They're at, and he says, I'm starving. Like, he's literally going to starve to death if he doesn't get that bowl of soup. I mean, we've all been hungry before, right? I mean, maybe even hangry. Esau is definitely hangry in this moment. But there's got to be some other food around. There's got to be some figs sitting around. There, there's got to be some other things taking place. He could have made himself some food. They're a wealthy family. Remember, this is Abraham's family. They have flocks. They have servants. They have all this type of stuff. But in this moment of desperation, in this moment of being hangry, he 
is willing to give up his entire birthright. Why? Because he doesn't value it. He doesn't, he shows contempt for it. And what we see in this moment, in this moment of desperation, this moment of, of a bad decision, that birthright moves from Esau to Jacob. They swore upon each other. And now, for the rest of the New Testament, or for the rest of the Old Testament, Jacob is the primary figure. He's the one that God uses and works through his family line. We're not going to get too far ahead here, but this is an important moment of, of, of changing that, that over there. Now, what happens to Esau? We're going to read a little bit more about Esau in the days ahead. Uh, but he eventually does become another nation, the, the Edomites. And the Edomites pop up here and there in the Old Testament as a foe, fighting with the Israelites. At one point, they even uh, came along and uh, teamed up with, with Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon to harass the, the Israelites, uh, to, to fight against them. So there's, there's contempt, just as God said, in their mother's womb, um, fighting between these two groups for the rest of time, for the rest of the time that they, that they existed. Now, what do we do with something like this? Because... We're not really selling our birthrights for, for stew. But how many times do we make very short-sighted decisions? We make decisions based on feelings and emotion. Uh, things that we, we're not looking at the big picture. That we, we make snap decisions. We make quick judgments. But we trade something uh, valuable for something that we want right here and in this moment. I think we can all look back at, at points in our life where we've done that before. How do we be patient in those moments? How do we trust God in those moments? Here we saw Esau just not really value what he, what he had, what was special. Uh, in our lives, there are going to be many times where we're going to be tempted to, to compromise, to tempted to take something uh, good in the moment and trade something far better in our future. That's one of the essentials here of, of spending time with God each day. That we walk into the day aware, aware that we are children of God, aware that God is present and with us, aware that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And it takes that constant coming back reminder each and every day, stepping to each day into faith because you're going to be faced with a million different decisions over the course of our life. Today, you're going to be faced with, with a bunch of decisions to make. Maybe some big decisions, maybe not some big decisions, but there's that potential there and that, that potential to take a shortcut. That, that potential to, to uh, move something ahead and, and trade something better in the future for something good now. Maybe in your workplace, maybe with your kids. And we need to trust, trust God's plan. Trust and rely on God in those moments to, to help us to be people of integrity. To, to look at the big picture of what he's called us to do. And to be patient. To be patient. We want to know the end of the story. We want to know how this decision is going to affect us for the rest of our lives, but often we don't. We just have to take the next right step and trust that that's going to lead to great things in the future. All right, let's go ahead and pause there for today. And uh, man, if you were encouraged today, if you know someone that you think, man, they, they need to hear that message, share it with them. <laughs> Shoot them a text. Tell them what you learned here today. Share what God is doing in your life. If it's easier just to share the video, feel free to do that. Invite them to come along to the Daily Race. But we need to make sure that what we're learning, we're sharing with others. And that we are multipliers with what God has done in our lives. All right, let's go ahead and pray as we start the day. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. And God, we're just taking our first steps today aware of your presence. Aware of your love for us. Aware of your plan for us. And God, also just stepping in faith. Just one step. God, we know that you, you know the absolute best path forward in our lives. God, that you have a, a path laid out for us, uh, a preferred path, a path of protection and provision. And God, we, although we'd like to know all the steps in it, God, we're trusting you for one step today. Guide us and lead us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right. Well, hey, I hope you have a great, great rest of the day. I look forward to seeing you 24 hours from now right back here on The Daily Race. Love you guys.